This is uh, Executive Chef Jojo Vasquez from the Plantation House in Kapalua. And uh, he's no stranger to the limelight because he was one of Chef Morimoto's trusted sous chefs and later his chef de cuisine. He was one of Morimoto's assistants for two seasons in Iron Chef America. Growing up in Chicago, he began his culinary sojourn as his father's mini sous, helping with his family's Chinese Filipino catering business. After a quick detour through physical therapy training, he found that his true passion was cooking and transferred to the culinary program at Kendall College in Evanston, Illinois and graduated with a culinary degree. Vasquez then took a line cook job at Rhapsody at the Chicago Symphony Center and he later worked alongside Troy Thompson in Atlanta's Fuse Box restaurant and then in 2002 moved to Los Angeles to help open the Ritz Carlton in Marina del Rey and Jereen restaurant. In 2005 he made chef de cuisine at Banyan Tree at the Ritz Carlton Hotel in Kapalua. Though he left a few years later to join Morimoto's team as executive chef at Morimoto Waikiki it was during this time that he assisted on Iron Chef America to Chef Morimoto. The lure of Banyan Tree called him back to Maui and Vasquez returned to the restaurant in 2010, bringing with him his refined approach to cooking, which includes notes of molecular gastronomy from his tours in Spain and France and through Europe, his love of pan Asian flavors and desire to further refine Hawaii's regional cuisine. In late 2012, he joined the Plantation House and is now the executive chef. Today, he's, with, he's here today with you because he's going to welcome you to Bangkok Chinatown and he's going to walk you through the best of the street food. So please welcome to your school, executive chef Jojo Vasquez. Thank you, thank you. All right. It's hard to follow up those two chefs before me, huh? Pressure. Guys, we're going to take you to the streets now. Thailand, of course, is known for so many different flavors because of all the neighboring uh, countries around it. And I'm going to show you one thing that I saw within a book that I love that my wife gave me from David Thompson, Thai Street Food. David Thompson is a one, I'm sorry, two-star Michelin acclaimed chef from Australia that studied over in Thailand for many years. Uh, he developed a restaurant that really inspired the essence of Thailand. Uh, with that being said, he created one book that I believe was about 1,200 pages. The first 700 pages were just giving uh, acknowledgement to the people of Thailand. This second book that I have is filled with beautiful pictures of a lot of the street food, the stall holders and everybody in place that makes everything uh, uh, as it is with the, the essence of Thailand. So I can pass this around so you guys can take a look at that. I'll start that over here. And I also have some fun toys to pass around too that were gifts from some of my cooks to their travels. Now I have not been to Thailand uh, because uh, people like me and Joey have to work. So uh, with their travels, I said, bring me something back. Uh, one thing that they gave me <clears throat> was this beautiful cleaver and this is from Bangkok. I told them, can you have them inscribe something for me? And uh, the cook said, what? And I said, I wanted to say the thunder, because <laughs> it's so big, yeah? So, this is safe, right? Should I, should I have them sign something or what? <laughs> Chefs, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go pass around a cleaver. <laughs> yeah, I don't wanna get sued. Uh, so, another gift that uh, was given to me was from Chiang Mai. And this is my own personal mortar and pestle. You know, so when they approached me, to say, let's do something for Thailand, of course. I went directly to that book for inspiration and uh, I, I grabbed the tools of their trade because I wanna try to make this as authentic as possible. All right, let's start the journey. The first thing I'm gonna make, uh, I believe they passed out some recipes for you. It's called Kanom Krok. Is anyone here Thai? No, okay, because that's exactly how you say it. <laughs> Kanom Krok. So Kanam Krok uh, is defined as Thai cupcakes. Thai cupcakes are basically served from the morning all the way to night. 
Uh, if you have seen pictures of uh, Thailand, the hustle and bustle of it, it goes 24-7, you know? So if you can imagine all this street fair and all this energy going through, this is one thing that they start serving early in the morning all the way through the wee hours of the night. And it's a nice savory meat sweet snack that's uh, comprised of rice flour and uh, coconut milk and shredded coconut, a little bit of jasmine rice that's cooked, all made into a batter. And one interesting ingredient that I've never worked with before is called lime paste. So lime paste, this one's called limestone paste, is, is uh, basically made from creating calcium oxide from calcium carbonate through heat. So the end product after it's been fired off is a very thick paste. Now what was interesting was uh, as, as recipes are developed, you know, you're, you're really tried and true to, to, to practice, practice, practice. I had made it without this one ingredient and I was wondering why it wasn't coming out crispy. Finally, when it got into my hands, I understood that this is what makes it crispy. So as I further read within the book, a lot of uh, recipes that were batter filled or crepes or anything like that ask for this lime paste. So this is uh, something from their pantry that's uh, very exclusive. All right, to start the batter, look at this, I have a crew, I love it. Okay. I'm your sous chef. Yeah. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna make the batter that starts off with, of course, uh, hydrating the lime paste. So that lime paste, uh, I hydrate it in water, and we don't wanna use that residue or sludge if anything forms towards the bottom. So I'm gonna uh, strain that out, uh, but I'm gonna be combining uh, hot water in that lime paste to make that uh, uh, kind of milky slurry. Uh, I'm also gonna be adding rice flour and arrowroot to start the batter. So, all my powder stuff. Look at that. That's cool. You know, guys, at any time you can uh, ask me questions. You can keep this nice and lively. Is it, can you explain the lime piece? Is it actually coming from lime? Or no. Uh, that's right. No, no, no reflection of, of lime per se. Um, I actually don't know why they called it lime paste. Oh. Um, but again, it's, it's made from calcium oxide that's been heated through. Okay, I have my dry product in there. I'm gonna give this about one cup of lime water. Actually, I'm gonna go half and half. I don't want it to be too crispy. So I'm gonna go, also this is just plain tap water. And the product, of course, is just gonna, to make a, a tight dough. Because what I wanna do then is the next step is I'm gonna start buzzing uh, the rice and the, the harder ingredients, like the coconut, in the blender. So when I mix it together, I can uh, really manage it with more water. And if it needs to be more crispy, then more uh, lime, lime paste water, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and mix this up together. And then while this is mixing, uh, Chef, if you can put in those two ingredients into the blender. If you look through that book, there's a picture of that in there also. And uh, you know, I, uh, I really immerse myself into finding, you know, the authenticity of anything that I need to make. So I, I also verge, uh, uh, verse into uh, YouTube and I saw them making this and they use a really big pan and it has all of these hemisphere divots. So it looks like a takoyaki pan. Um, and uh, when I saw uh, that in the book, I, I knew that I had this Danish evil skyver pan to make those pancakes, those, those perfectly round pancakes. So uh, that's how I'm gonna replicate this dish for you today. Okay. So now, I'm gonna buzz, I'm gonna buzz up the dry products, which is the rice, the coconut milk, and I'm gonna use a little bit more of this lime water, just to start it off. 
What's important that I learned also when making this recipe was I really want to, uh, you know, blitz all of this ingredients. Otherwise, it's going to cause friction and stick onto the pan. Uh oh. I, I think I touch it about six times a day. Yeah, you're going to learn in your profession that just like ingredients, you know, you have the best ingredients to make food, it really uh, uh, stands uh, sound also with equipment. So. You know, I, I never really cut corners on uh, what I need to perform in the kitchen. It's, it's very important that when I talk to my cooks, I say, I want to give you all the tools to be successful. You know, you just have to take care of it. So on a weekly basis, you know, we kind of rotate everybody. And uh, just like a car, they totally polish it off with toothpicks, you know. So they go all through the corners and take it all off. And yeah, they don't look forward to that rotation. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's all about taking care of your stuff. And ever since I was a kid, I was very particular about even my matchbox cars, just like my son. He wants all the colors in a row, you know. That's kind of like uh, the, the fine grain of a chef. You want to see how methodical they are, you know. You can't get from A to Z without going through the alphabet. So that's how I am with the kitchen. I, I can't start cooking until everything is clean, right. If you have that instilled in with yourself, you'll be more organized, you'll be fast, and you'll get a lot more done. Okay. So I blitz this one up. I'm going to go ahead and add the second part of the batter right inside. And uh, you know, with the time constraint that we have, this uh, batter really calls to hold it, if not four hours and overnight. So with the miracle of TV, I have a batter already made. And uh, we're going to go ahead and start cooking. I just want to go through the process so you guys will see. Thank you, Chef. Uh, how it's made. Very, very simple. The second part of that uh, recipe is the filling. So as the filling goes, it says coconut cream, salt, and sugar. <clears throat> Those items are, are basically just uh, mixed through until any particles of the sugar has, has dissipated, so you don't have any uh, crystals. Yeah. So it's a nice sweet topping that I put onto it. and. Uh, as I practiced making a lot of these, what I noticed was I put it at the very end so it won't make it soggy. Now, when uh, Chef Joey was starting, I started to make some, and uh, we're gonna make some all through my uh, second part of the demo. So the chefs are gonna be up here to help me. And uh, I wish I had a bigger pan, I can crank it out, but uh, we're gonna be going at two, four, six, seven at a time. Um, if these can be passed around. Those can be passed around and we can just go ahead and start refilling it. Um, thank you. I'll take this whole thing. Uh, I think I wrote down a couple of the ingredients that they suggested for toppings, which were scallions, corn, or sweet potato. Um, one of my local farmers over there in Maui has some beautiful Okinawan sweet potatoes, so I just blanched that up and cut up some scallions. Um, that's all going to be utilized over here also. So that pan is warming up. Uh, it's a really nice non-stick, so it should be fairly fast when I make that. And um, I'm going to use a little bit of vegeline. Uh, of course, in uh, Asia, they use uh, ghee. Does anybody know what ghee is? Clarified butter, right? Um, very uh, popular with Indian cooking. So what they do is they, they hold a, a little batch of aromatics, whether it's bruised lemongrass or kaffir lime leaf, 
any type of the uh, authentic ingredients and they wrap it in cheesecloth and they just leave it in the ghee. So they just grab that and they just pop, 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 pop like that. So it's pretty cool. Any, any chance that you can infuse flavor or layer it, you know, I, I think it's great. Take it in the back here. Thank you. No questions so far? What do you find the, uh, is it available in the market? Um, that one, um, it was very hard. I asked uh, six different vendors and they didn't have it. So uh, uh, Sheldon actually had some, so I brought it from Sheldon. And then later, uh, Darylin found some over here, so I don't know where she found it, but uh, it's cool to have. I also had this one uh, pie, pie tin for a lid. Oh, can I have that pie tin here? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and make the first batch and then the chefs can go ahead and uh, continue to bust this out and help me. So, uh, again, the garnishes that I have over here are the uh, oaky sweet potatoes, just blanched. Uh, I have some scallion, and then I also have that uh, cream mixture, that sweet filling that I put on top. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get this to a nice medium, medium heat. And um, when that's hot, I'm gonna spray it with a little bit of oil and put the batter about halfway through. I'm gonna give it a nice swirl so it uh, conforms into a cup, and then that cup's gonna get nice and crispy later to be filled with uh, the uh, oaky potato and also the scallion. So, this is going here. Our trusty Vegeline. Any questions? <laughs> Paste. Yes. There's a Chinese ingredient just called lime water, L-Y-M-B. It's used in the, in, in the uh, white puppy cake. Okay. You know the one that's kind of, you know the one that you enjoy? Rice cake. Rice cake, maybe rice flour. Okay. And I'm wondering if it's the same stuff. It's it could be. Sure, yeah. Again, the property is to achieve crispness in right. batters. Yeah. So if that certain cake has a kind of a brownish crisp, no? no, it no? Doesn't, but what it does do is cause it to bubble. Okay. It's very, very light. Okay. Maybe if it's used sparingly, it could be the same thing. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and just fill halfway through. You know, the ones we passed around, uh, it, it might have uh, sat for a bit and got soggy, but you know, just like takoyaki, it's the best when it comes off the hot skillet, yeah? These are so popular, they serve them all day again, like I said. So, you know, they sell them by the dozens and they uh, just pop them around while they're eating. Uh, before it settles, I'm gonna give it a nice, easy swirl. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, create that cup and it's gonna be a nice thin layer. You guys see that? And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and let it uh, go for a little bit. So in about two minutes, we're gonna see that it's gonna to start to tighten up. As that tightens up, I'm gonna go ahead and add the fillings. And at the very, very end, I'm just gonna put just a very small amount of this cream. So, uh, I wanted to, uh, create another dish, and that dish is called khao soy. Now khao soy is called uh, noodles and curry. Now the cool thing about uh, this dish when I was looking through uh, Chef Thompson's book was there are a lot of authentic homeland recipes from Thailand, but there are even more that are uh, uh, migrated from the neighboring countries. So I also included a map. I don't know if that was printed on the back, but you can see by location, China and also India is right above them. So that reflection by cuisine, that's why I chose this dish because the noodles are from China and the curry is from India, okay? Okay, you can see that it's setting. It's setting a little bit right there. 
I want to continue to cook it a little bit because what I'm looking for is for the edges to get a little bit more crispy. And it's very soft batter right now, so I'm going to let that go for just a little bit. Is that steaming it? Sir? It's steaming it to help it. Then towards the end, about three quarters before it's done, I'll just leave the lid and I'll just let the air make it uh, uh, finish off yeah, nice and crispy. So while that's going, I'm going to go ahead and pull off uh, more ingredients over here to start off the coconut curry. <clears throat> Just like the chefs uh, before me, uh, they were talking about a lot of the uh, uh, indigenous ingredients, about layering the food, about the heat, you know. But uh, uh, as you guys know, growing up or, or, or going grocery shopping here, a lot of the cuisines in the melting pot of Hawaii are, are Filipino, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, or what have you. We share a lot of the same ingredients, like ginger, garlic, cilantro, peppers is just the fashion of how they use it per country, okay? Uh, in Thailand, the cook that uh, I got this mortar and pestle from, from Chiang Mai, he had said the most interesting thing he saw while he was walking to a lot of these stall holders were, everybody uses a cleaver, nobody uses like a chef knife, nobody uses a paring knife, no, there aren't like all these knives that you get from your kit. And they just kind of bruise, there's no method and technique to it. It's all about kind of like chopping it up because most of the end product is all about the fashion of grinding, right? So they grind, grind, grind. And uh, what's interesting is uh, uh, my trip uh, back to the Philippines, I wanted to cook for everybody. And, and me being the American, I'm like, so where's the, the ground black pepper? And they're all laughing at me. They said, we grind ours daily. I'm like, yes. And it made me really happy. You know? So uh, at home, I choose to grind my pepper fresh daily also. OK, so that's uh, starting to set. So. Chef Joe, I'm gonna show you. I'm just gonna put a little bit. It's just garnish, yeah? So, a little bit is fine. Did you cook these with the skin on, Chef? How did you cook the food here? You know, depending upon what potato I use, I have different cooking methods. If I go um, like fingerling potatoes, I, I, uh, I like to salt roast them. So, just kind of embed it in some salt and I put it in the oven. So, I'm really extracting the moisture. So when I uh, sell them, of course, they're salted on the outside and it's like really all the moisture has come out and it's like really like a, like a baked potato when you bite into it. But with sweet potatoes, what I always noticed is I like to uh, peel them and then blanch them whole, you know, because when you cut it down, you always have that one to five minute window when you can overcook it, you know what I mean? So I keep it whole, I constantly check it. Everyone in my kitchen has uh, uh, pastry, uh, uh, what's, what's that called? P the pastry, uh, the tips, cake, the cake oh, testers, yeah, yeah. because we're constantly checking fish and just putting it right to our lips to see if it's warm or not, you know? So that's another trick that we do back in the kitchen. So uh, I just check the potato by, by giving it a little poke poke and uh, see if it's cooked all the way through, if it's tender enough. Okay, so a little bit of the garnish right on top. I'm starting to see a little bit more uh, color on it. It definitely needs to go a little bit more to be crispy. So I would say just about maybe three, four more minutes. And then we're just going to put just this much. Is this the same batter just as like that. the Filipino fresh lumpia? Very similar. Yeah, similar. very similar. Very similar. And that's why, you know, I, I had mentioned that, you know, these Asian countries, there's definitely a reflection that people will migrate, what have you, and show them the best of the best, you know? It, it's, I think it's a, it's a beautiful uh, concession to know. Okay, so chefs are gonna do that one, and then of course you can just use the tongs. This is non-stick, so it just flips right out. Okay, the next one. Uh, I'm gonna be making the uh, khao soy. The khao soy is a very easy recipe. Basically, I have the ingredients of shallot, ginger, garlic. I have uh, utilizing the stems of the cilantro, not just the leaves. Uh, and I also have some dried chilies. Now the dried chilies, in effect, I can measure my heat, okay? I do that first by getting the dried chilies, soaking them in hot water, and then I'm gonna decide how many seeds to take out. I can take them all out or I can leave them all in. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, for every pepper, that spine that runs through and all the seeds that, that uh, connect to it, that's where the Scoville level comes from. That's where the heat comes from. So when it's soaked in water, 
you're, you're basically making chili water, right? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a, a bunch of these ingredients a little bit at a time, and uh, I wish I had a bigger uh, uh, mortar. Um, so what I'm going to do is just start grinding, 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 make my paste, and then that paste I'm going to develop into a nice deep flavor, which is going to toast in the pan for this beautiful dish. I'm also going to use the liquid to help this move through, because when it's dry, of course, uh, a little bit too much friction. Sure. So, you know, we just go a little bit at a time until it's all done. And it doesn't have to be super fine, more than, you know, uh, uh, able to distribute in the pan. All right, so I have a little bit of everything in there minus the two dry products. The two dry products that I have over here as powders is coriander and also turmeric. Now turmeric is used, of course, all across Asia, very prominent in India because this gives that beautiful golden hue, right, that you would see in curries, that you would see in batters, that you would see in a lot of their cuisine. And it also has this beautiful intoxicating uh, aroma, you know, that I, I like to say it smells like perfume. So that's used a lot uh, also in that cuisine. Okay, so as uh, Chef Cam is doing that, uh, I'll find you a little bowl. You could put that in. Yeah, that's fine. Look at that one. Whoa. Yeah. That, that that's, one's from China. That's, that's, that's when you supersize it, kids. Yeah, I mean, we can collectively do all this. Yeah. How am I doing on time here? <laughs> I don't want to take anything away from the next chef. Now you said uh, that you like to use the stems. I like to use the stems in cilantro too. I think there's actually more flavor in cilantro stems than there are in leaves. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's a, a common misconception with some people, that they're afraid to use the stems. Yeah. And I don't it, like when I find stems in the trash can. Me too, you know, that's one of my pet peeves. Uh, I don't know if you guys do that here in school, but you know, I, I keep little buckets around my cooks too because we, we collectively save everything. I don't like to see anything in the trash because there's so many opportunities that can turn from this stock to that stock to transfer for another recipe. Um, in my master recipe book, um, I'll, I'll put some uh, asterisks sometimes. So if uh, uh, one component is only uses a small amount of increment of anything, you know that it'll be transferred again for the next part of the recipe. You know, so nothing should be wasted. Okay, so Chef Cam is doing that. The recipe also calls for cooked noodles, which uh, we have a big old pile right over here. And uh, also, the chicken. I, I thought to go ahead, guys, so I made a, a big batch also in uh, the back. So while Chef Cam is grinding that, I'm going to go ahead and do a finished grind or a finished plate on this big platter. And then uh, the chefs can also disperse this for you guys to taste. Um, as this goes, uh, what they uh, like to do is use uh, the noodles as the base and also as the garnish. So I have the same noodles also fried. And um, of course, in a lot of the Asian cuisines, you just have some beautiful leaves of cilantro all across for garnish. I'm gonna cut some lime wedges. And this can be passed around too. I also have some bean sprouts. It's all about layering. Oh, thank you. Let me cut this right here. Okay, how about we go over some facts? I looked up, I looked up over here from my mortar and pestle, my little baby one that I got over here. Uh, they left.
the price on it. So it said 300 baht. Baht is their, their form of currency. So this one said 300 baht, and I looked it up how much the conversion is. It's uh, three US to every 100. So this thing only costs $9. It's just, it's so cool. You know, next time I, I know that someone's going back to Asia or what have you, I'm definitely gonna give them a you know, hundred spot and have them go crazy. You know, see what they come back with. What other some facts here? Oh, that's fine. That's perfect. Yeah, it's, again, it's going to get distributed as I toast it. I also have some... Here's some crispy fried shallots also. Any questions, guys? No? Yes. Is there anything I, I brought back to the restaurant? Oh. What did you learn? What did you bring back from that experience? Sure. Um, <clears throat> sure. I think the question was, correct me if I'm wrong, what did you learn from the Iron Chef? What did you learn from that experience and what did you bring back to your own kitchen from that experience? Um, you know, do, doing Iron Chef was, uh, was very intense. You know, it's, it's just as you see on TV, it's a one hour battle. And uh, uh, I, I learned, of course, you know, when I'm talking about the, the, the organization of a chef, this applies because what we do is we create five dishes within one hour. And we're not just doing a show plate, but we're also doing several because we have to do it for the judges, we have to do it for the picture. And uh, if you're not, of course, done, then, then you're minus, you know, one certain plate. So organization, uh, to work under pressure, uh, communication, um, all of that stuff, because uh, what you see on TV, uh, what you don't know is it takes 13 hours to record one show. So there's a lot of, um, it's, the one, it's a true one hour battle. They're, they're continually recording, but there's the, the, the judging, the, the editing. They're gonna tell, come back over here and just stand right here. They want like, you know, certain shots. Um, uh, a lot of stuff kind of to, uh, to feed uh, the final show and uh, you know we, we sit and we wait for a long time it's 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 pretty nerve-wracking you know because you're waiting and then uh, at that you know 10th or 11th hour when uh, they are gonna announce the judge you're, you're pretty much like I'm, I'm done with it <laughs> you know I just want to go home and uh, the the cool thing about Iron Chef you know after I did it my uh, first year was they, they compile it all within like one to two weeks so they call it like uh, Iron Chef Hell Week, and then we'll constantly see other chefs or contenders or what have you, and uh, they, they comprise it to, if not just one battle, or they'll do two battles in one day, you know? And uh, sometimes I'll do battles back to back, and uh, the cool thing that uh, Morimoto does is he has several executive chefs, and he has all these properties, so he knows all the strengths of these chefs. So, um, We'll have a big roster, you know, of, of uh, chefs that we'll compete with, and they'll say, okay, Jojo, I know that you'll know a lot to do with this chef, or, or you'll know how to combat this chef, you know, and, and we just go at it, you know. So it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, thinking on your feet, reacting, changing, last minute. Yeah, it, it taught me how to, to move fast, how to move fast. You know, they're always going to talk about efficiency in your kitchen. You have to be efficient. <clears throat> uh, I did mackerel, I did quail, I did coconut, um, I did sea bass. Um, you know, it's, it's all maybe mackerel? Yeah. yeah. Mackerel was the hardest one? Sure, yeah. yeah. No, quail, quail was the hardest one. 
because you can overcook quail in a second, you know. So, um, and there's all these techniques that you want to go through your head, and you know, my, my head kind of works like a computer. So if you, if I say basil, you know, all of a sudden my mouth will salivate. And I know what basil tastes like. I know what it smells like. And then all of a sudden, like all this crazy voices go in my head, and I can do this, 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 and this with basil, you know. So. Uh, uh, when we talk and he'll say, oh, I got noodles. I'm like, ooh, what am I going to do with noodles? And kind of like it goes into a Rain Man effect. And I'm like, I can do all this with noodles. Okay, so this is getting hot. Uh, he made this beautiful paste. You see that, guys? You know, so, so if you know that the authenticity is, can be created with a mortar and pestle, you know, take that. You, use that advantage to your cuisine. Because, of course, I could have thrown this all into a blender and buzz it all up. But if this is how they make it, and you want to represent that cuisine, do it as authentic as possible. All right. Any other questions? No? Yes? Hot, hot right off the griddle. Yeah, that's why I was saying, you know, just like takoyaki or crepes or anything that comes off the griddle, this is, this is produced by a stall holder, you know, so people are just lined up to get it. It's not like they're holding it, you know what I mean? They're coming right off the pan and you're buying it. Yeah, so I was doing some back over there and of course, like any batter, you know, as it sits, then it kind of loses that crispness and what have you. Okay, so this is also a finished product, so we can also pass this out for the kids if there's any little cups, tasting cups or anything like that, chef. Uh, you know, I want them to try the flavors. You're gonna taste the complexity of the, of the curry in there. Um, I'm gonna put a little bit of fried noodles there too. You're gonna see the, the, the textural difference over here with the fried noodles and the fried shallots. But, you know, this is a, a beautiful family style type of dish. And again, this is through the migration of, of China and also the influence of India that creates uh, this curry. So, by, uh, by method and technique, of course, this is gonna be toasting. So you're just sweating this out, Chef? Yes. Kind of I'm, gonna to I'm gonna sweat it out and toast it so all of the flavors really develop as it gets a little bit of uh, color. I don't know if you've been noticing, but all of our dishes is about building flavors or stacking flavors on top of each other, um, complementing them, um, grinding them, and then moving them to the pot and releasing those beautiful flavors as we build each step by step, all right? Just like building a, a house, you know, start with the floor, first floor, you never start with the second floor and then move to the front floor. I'm gonna leave this one here with you. <clears throat> More so questions, you a, guys? You have a finish <laughs> after this? Yes, I'm gonna, again, toast this. I'm gonna get a little bit, it's gonna turn brown. All uh -huh. the flavors will develop. That way I know at least uh, uh, the complexity has been released, yeah. natural oils. And then I'm going to cover it with some uh, chicken broth and coconut milk. Um, as, as you would purchase, you know, uh, Thai, uh, uh, what, what's that brand? May Ploy has all of these different uh, uh, Thai pastes, you know. They, you'll see like a yellow one or a green one or a red one. Those are just different profile flavors. So this is very close to the yellow one because of the turmeric. Remember I was saying the turmeric, of course, uh, elevates cuisine by, by aroma, you know, and also color. Um, if you see the green one, it's more chili based, and the red, of course, you know, a different preference of the capsule. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I, had, I had several uh, uh, test batches and uh, I, I was wondering why it wasn't getting crispy um, but before the, the lime paste I just put it onto a big pan and I was making crips. Yes. To anything you want. 
yeah, to anything you want. So, uh, uh, you know, if you want to get that nice, you know, herbaceous the cilantro or some bean sprouts or cooked chicken or what have you and fold it over. But yes, it's a very, very versatile batter. Yeah, you make like a, like a summer roll or a Thai summer roll, something like that. Might be a good idea. I don't know. Yeah, very easy batter. So when you look at those ingredients, I mean, you guys can make this at home, yeah? Very, very easy. It's important to rest that batter too, I'm, I'm sure, Chef. It is, it is, yeah. That's why I, I chose to uh, pre-make some and bring it over. Um, yes? Cereal? Potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't have to be Thai food? Is that the question? No, your um, favorite food. I think she's asking us, like, what, what's our favorite food? Um, uh, I love oyakodon. Udon? Yeah. What was that, Chef? Uh, oyakodon. It uh, means mother and child. It's, it's uh, basically uh, it's chicken thigh in, in, a, in a dashi broth, uh, balanced out with sugar and, and, and uh, soy. So it's like mother and child. Uh... Yes, because it's it's a. Uh, I'm I'm very much into one pot cooking. Yeah, anything I can do for one pot cooking. I do Indian food. I like Indian food, and I have my Indian spices. And again, I don't like the clean. You know, so again, going back to that one pot. You know, just a little Indian stew. Very simple, easy. Um, some pork or something like that yes. and um, just over some brown rice pretty much what I do I mean what do you eat chef you know it's, no, it's I don't cook at home so I'll have I'll have my wife cook for me otherwise I won't be able to cook I mean eat my food but what I like to eat is it inner stuff from the animal Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited. I hope she's uh, yeah. She's early. Yeah. Yes? Uh, Sydney Gong? She said she's going to have it. We got adobo. That's oh, it. Nervous. I know. <laughs> she don't yeah. Any, anything Filipino? Ligado? So as this broth goes, guys, it's very simple. You saw that you, uh, uh, we made the curry that was pestled. You can shelf that in the refrigerator forever how long. Just take the amount that you need. I just added the stock and also the coconut milk. I'm going to wait for this to come to a boil. Then I'm going to add some chicken thighs. The chicken thighs are, of course, seasoned before I lay them in. And then after that's cooked, shred it. You're going to pre-blanch your noodles and basically just add them together and garnish it just like how I showed. Yeah? So this is probably going to take a long time to come, but uh, you already have some tastings, so uh, that's basically it. Yeah? He, these guys, um, yes. do, different, do different little shops put different things on top? They do. I've seen it in the book with corn, corn kernels. Um, I, I think that anything basically that's a sweet garnish they will have, and, and uh, scallion is universal. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And are they way much faster? If I, if I had my takoyaki pan, which is uh, iron, it, it would probably be twice as fast. Uh, this, this is an evil skyver. This is made for like yeah, pancakes. Right. Yeah. 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 Coming from Chicago, you don't have anything influence like fish pizza or Chicago dogs? You, you know, I, I have in, in, my, in my freezer, I have an inventory of six deep dish pizzas at all times. And of course, because football is starting, you know, I, I need, that's, that's my thing. Um, Chicago Bears, yeah? Da Bears. Bears. Um, uh, every, I have about a good crew of 20 Chicago people back in Maui, and uh, we get together. And it's a family affair, so we, we, we get cool. together a potluck, and we got fried rice, we got biscuits and gravy, we got longanisa, we got all that stuff. So but you're, uh, you're a Cubs fan? I am a Cubs fan, yeah. Yes, yes, I'm a Cubs fan until I die. And, um, uh, you know, other influences, I, I, I went to school in Chicago and, and uh, I born and raised, so 
I worked with an Italian chef, and uh, that was my first forte into the kitchen. So uh, what was great about it was, you know, I wanted to go to an Italian restaurant in which they created everything by hand. You know, so I made sure I, I researched the chef and makes all of his pastas from scratch. Uh, his last name was Chia Petty, and he also owned a family-owned veal company. So we took down whole carcasses of pig and lamb and sides of beef. That's right, that's right. So um, again, just like anything else, I, I want to immerse myself in whatever I do. Yeah. Uh, Northside, Lincoln and Peterson. Uh, it's a north side by Lincoln and Peterson. It's about like a half a mile away from Wrigley Field. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great city, restaurant city. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, actually, I want to share one quote too before I close this up. Um, this is a quote from David Thompson. Again, that book is being passed around. You saw all the beautiful illustrations and pictures and what have you. Um, very engaging. But one thing that David Thompson, as I was reading the book, that really caught me was he said that Thai food ain't about simplicity. It's about the juggling of disparate elements to create a harmonious finish. Like a complex musical chord, it's got to have a smooth surface, but it doesn't matter what's happening underneath. Simplicity isn't the dictum here at all. Some Westerners think it's a jumble of flavors, but to a Thai that's important, it's the complexity they delight in. So again, what we're showing you again is the complexity of flavor, the layering. People might think, oh, it's too much, but they enjoy that. They like to do that. That's what they want to showcase, you know? So hopefully you guys are taking a lot of this inspiration that we're showing you guys, and you're seeing a lot of what we're doing by developing flavors and presentation. And uh, with the recipe I gave you, at least take advantage of that to see if you can replicate that at home. Huh? All right, guys, that's my time. Thank you. my restaurant oh. and it's kind of uh, based off of the I, I have uh, an artist friend that uh, does all my tattoos but um, I'm not gonna take off my shirt today but uh, basically this is a reflection of one of the tattoos that I have and um, the, the inspiration of it, it basically is uh, it's only myself the executive chef and my three sous chefs that wear that and I let them know that I have promoted or hired you to run and assist with the cuisine of my, of my restaurant. So I am trusting you with my brand and you're gonna wear that with honor. So uh, they really hold that dear to them. And with everyone that I work with, I, I expect them to be sponges and soak as much as they can from me. Because I worked with a lot of mentor chefs. And if they don't do that, then they're just kind of doing a daily grind. And uh, there hasn't been a time yet that I said, take off that jacket. You know, because I really hold it dear to me. You know, if they don't protect my cuisine, if they don't represent, you know, they shouldn't be wearing my badge. It's an honor thing. Yeah. And I, and I also want to mass market it and sell it. <laughs> so I, I run a three meal restaurant. Should I just talk about a couple of these? I, I run a three meal restaurant uh, up the hill, uh, Kapalua Estates. Uh, beautiful panoramic scenic view. Um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, I do a lot of big catering events. I'm located on top of a, uh, a golf course, so I do a lot of uh, golfers also. Uh, weddings are, are huge. Um, people come by because of the location. Um, uh, I, I, I learn and understand that you know, I can't always do the most progressive stuff that I want to do because you don't want to mess with anybody's breakfast, right? You want to do it hot, you want to do it fast, you want it to come out. Um, I save a lot of the beautiful pops and whistles for the dinner service because I like to say that they come in for, for breakfast and lunch or the AM product, and then after that, I draw the curtain, I re-raise it, and then you're here for a different experience for dinner. So, um, you know, I, 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 I can do everything. I, I, I can do desserts also. Um, when I went to school, I made it a point that uh, I studied ice carving, and I, I, I studied uh, advanced pastries, and uh, I never let any of my pastry chefs or cooks I never have them make anything I cannot make myself. You know, I can't say, oh, how do I do this, or here's a recipe. I always make it myself so I can say, this is where you messed up. Um, I, I do about two to three specials a, a night um, because what I want to do, of course, is uh, tap into to my creative medium every day. 
And um, just like today, you know, I could have done one, but I did two. So I like kind of putting myself not so much in the weeds, but you know, I, I want to work. If you tell me 40 minutes, I could probably do three things. You know what I mean? But I'd rather to show you guys two things that I like to do. That's foie gras. Um, that's uh, mahi, beautiful local carrots. That's actually a, a Thai coconut curry sauce. So I, I do make Thai Thai coconut curry. Um, I do opaka by the pounds. <laughs> fruit plate from breakfast. Uh, that's surfing goat dairy over in Maui, our, our own local goat cheese. I did a baked goat cheese and a savory granola. I used turmeric in there, right? Turmeric, it gives that nice aromatic. Um, I make a green tea tiramisu, a nice uh, emblem of the, of the Kapalua um, butterfly. That's hapu. We have these beautiful sculptures in the restaurant too. Um, uh, one of the local artists blows glass, so he made these beautiful glass sculptures. That one you saw was of jellyfish. We uh, had some light fixtures under it. So of course during the day, you can see all of this beautiful scenery. And at night, we chose to have a light show. So while you're dining, then all these beautiful lights are just shimmering everywhere. It's a kampachi tartar. You know, I, I eat, there's a, that dish I made. I did a little practice shot. I, I eat sashimi every day. I eat uh, a lot of uh, raw lettuce. Um, you know, uh, everyone's on this big uh, gluten-free kick or what have you. Uh, of course, it's very apparent in our restaurants, and I'm sure you're going to go over that in nutrition or, or restaurant service, but that's, that's this dish, the coconut curry. Or I'm sorry, the curry noodles. Um, but uh, for me, you know, I'm not a young buck anymore, so I know that rice, of course, breaks down into sugars. Sugars will... You know, not good for your system. So I, I make sure that you know me and my family were surrounded by a lot of hydroponic uh, greens and lettuces and vegetables. <clears throat> I like doing miniature, delicate stuff. You know, I do everything from mini crab cakes to cake pops to mini creme brulees to mini donuts. I have uh, six different eggs benedicts. We call it the six degrees of eggs benediction. Um, that's a uh, manchong. I do it with a nice tamarind uh, foam and watercress. Oh, that's a nice side view of, uh, I use opa belly, you know? O opa, as big as that fish is, the, the dorsal or the top side of the fish is very tough, yeah? So I always request for the belly. So I get the, just the belly and I do a nice uh, crust on it so it's always tender, you know? You, you guys are amongst the most beautiful product here within the islands. You just have to know how to use it, you know? You can say, yeah, I'm gonna use ahi, you know, I'm gonna make sashimi. But if you're getting, you know, three grade or what have you, you know what I mean? You shouldn't be serving it as sashimi. You have to know your product. Um, I do a lot of playful stuff. You know, for me, <clears throat> I do a lot of powders. I do a lot of, you know, spherification and stuff like that. But I don't let that lead my cuisine. I, I, I uh, have really, fostered myself to have restriction on, on what those elements will play as a part of my dishes. I, I, I use them only strictly for a garnish. It never takes the lead. Uh, there, that's a beautiful ahi sashimi. There's some beautiful tomato. There's some spheres over there. I need some basil caviar. Um, there's compressed pineapple. Do you guys compress anything here? Com compressed fruits or what have you? You know, that, that, that pretty much intensifies texture and flavor. There's a wagyu. <laughs> There's a wagyu tartar. Um, depending. So what you saw up there, I wanted to uh, uh, have cilantro. So uh, I made a simple syrup. I steeped a lot of cilantro. Then I vacuum packed it. Um, and uh, it also manipulates the shape. Yeah, So I can go paper thin and I can make ribbons. And um, with that dish, that was my take on, on pork and pineapple. So I had, um, I had pork belly, uh, which was, I rendered off the fat and made a dust. I did a prosciutto as a crisp. And then I got, um, I made like a hash and I compressed it into a perfect rectangle and then ribbons of pineapple. I make a lot of custards or chalmushis, you guys know? Yeah. I did like savory custards and I have all these pickles in my refrigerator. Yeah. It's like I'm saying, don't throw anything away. I'm like, pickle it. <laughs> pickle that. 
that's, I call this one, uh, that one, that chocolate was called uh, chocolate passion. So I have different layers of chocolate. I make a bittersweet chocolate cake, chocolate ice cream, chocolate dipped strawberry. All right, thank you very much.